And he did it because he wanted to connect you in a greater way with him. Now, that's true for all of us, but maybe you came reluctantly or maybe you just came wondering. But the Apostle Paul said one time that he was, was, he was before a group of people, and I'm summarizing what he was saying to the Areopagus, that, you know, God brought me here to you. I'm not, it's not accidental that I'm here. It's not accidental that you're here. And God has been all around you all this time. He's not far from you, but he brought me here at this time to help make that real to you and to bring you closer to bridge that gap. And so maybe you're here and you don't know if you believe there is a God. That's okay. We believe God brought you here so that we can help bridge that gap. Maybe you're here and you're angry at God. That's okay too. Many of us have been angry at God in our lives. But God brought you here to begin or continue something that he has designed to make a difference in this world and all eternity. So we are thrilled that you're here as a guest and for our members as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Inside of your worship bulletin is a set of notes if you want to pull those out. It'll help you be able to follow along a little bit better, maybe in, to, uh, to make me a little less boring. But we're in a series that we launched at the beginning of the year. Every year we pick a theme, and the theme for this year was, it's on the stage, less is more. And it's taken from a story where John the Baptist is on the scene, and he is the hot new evangelist. And lots of people are responding to John. He's really popular. And he's got some disciples that are following him and are really loyally committed to him. But all of a sudden, another evangelist shows up on the scene. And the leaders of, uh, of, of John's ministry look at this other guy and go, hold it. That guy over there is teaching, and he's getting bigger crowds than we are. And so they come to John, and they say to John, basically, John, you know that guy that you, you're so up on, this, this other guy? And, well, he's now baptizing more people and teaching more people than we are or you are. And there's a competitiveness that's there in the hearts of the disciples. Well, in response, John said of the other evangelist, and the other evangelist's name, by the way, was Jesus. Uh, John said of Jesus and to his disciples, he very quickly let him know that John was not in competition with Jesus. When he said in John chapter 3, verse 30, in the contemporary English version, Jesus must become more and I must become less. So this is a year that in everything we do, we're going to emphasize how do we make sure that we are magnifying Jesus and putting him at the forefront while we take a step back, believing the best thing for Jesus and the best thing for each of us, especially as a church, is to make sure that Jesus is the one who is more and we are less. Now, in the first series, first of the lesson, we just saw, uh, in the series, we just laid out the less is more theme and talked about that in detail. But in the second lesson of the series, we began to show how the I must become less, Jesus must become more theme of the year integrates with the eternal purposes of God. You see, everywhere we, every year we pick a theme as a church that kind of keeps us on task, that keeps us focused. But every year we also talk about how does this year, one year theme, how does it incorporate and how does it fit in with the eternal purposes of God? So a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about the greatest purposes of the church. And the first and greatest purpose of the church is to worship God. Now, it's really important that you define worship correctly because worship is not the singing of songs. It's not alone. It's not the giving of money. It's not the serving. Worship is the surrender to God. The New Testament word, proskuno, has to do with bowing down to kiss a ring. Two things are essential for worship to happen. Number one, there has to be a submission. That's the bowing down. Secondly, there has to be affection. You're loving. You're kissing the one. So it's, you're throwing it. It's, it's an incredible way of life. And you can do a lot of acts, whether it would be singing or whether it would be praying, and all they are acts, unless your heart's in it. And so we said the greatest and the most enduring purpose, greater than any other purpose we have as a church, is the purpose of worshiping God in in, in the way that we exalt him in our hearts and it shows up in everything we do in our lives. Last week, we began a two-part series on the second, the most, not the greatest purpose, but the most urgent purpose for the church. And the most urgent purpose for the church is not given in, in the great commandment, which when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The most urgent purpose of the church is given in the Great Commission, where Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always till the end of the age. And the reason it is the most urgent 
is of all the purposes that we will talk about over the next several weeks, it is the only one that has a time stamp on it. It is the only one that will cease at some point. All of the other ones, when it comes to loving God, we will do that in heaven. When it comes to serving, we'll do that in heaven. When it comes to uh, encouraging and, and fellowshipping with each other, we'll do that in heaven. But when Jesus gives the Great Commission, he says, here's what you need to know. This one has a timestamp. I will be with you in this commission, and then the end of the age will come, and that come, that time comes when Jesus returns. And at that point, there will be no second chances. There will be no chance to share our faith with someone who is lost, there will be no chance to urge somebody who is a follower to be more like Jesus so that the people around him will have an opportunity of salvation. Everybody's fate will be set, and this purpose will disappear into eternity. That's why it's urgent, because you see, if you and I aren't doing this one, then we're going to have problems someday because some of the people that we care about or some of the people that God longed for us to know best and love most, we will never even meet because we weren't urgent in obeying and embracing this purpose. Now, last week we began by saying the call to make disciples can be broken down into two different segments. And if you happen to be away at the retreat, uh, let me encourage you to go back and listen to, to the last week's lesson, not because it's me, but it, because it is super important and super fundamental to what we're doing. But last week we said the first part of the Great Commission is that we go into the world and we preach the gospel to the lost. The first part of making disciples is reaching the lost, but it's only the first part. It's an essential part. The second part is where we develop those disciples in a way that a reciprocal kind of ongoing cycle occurs to where people are being saved, they're becoming like Jesus, and because of that, more people are being reached and saved. So the first half is reaching the lost. The second half is discipling the saved. On your notes, we have the Great Commission, and I've got it in the voice translation or voice paraphrase. And the reason I want you to read out of the voice, anytime you read a commission, anytime you read anything, by the way, the Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples, we kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're familiar with this church, you know we talk about that a lot. But it's easy for something that's familiar to miss it. That's why it's really important for you guys that are members here. And especially you people that are leaders, every year we go through a series somehow that emphasizes the purposes of the church. And if you're not really careful because of the redundancy and what can become ritual, you will listen less to something that is more important. So let me encourage you, don't disengage this morning if you're a leader, if you're a member going, yeah, I know that, I know that. I want to ask you to go beyond that and really go, do I know that? My dad used to say, you know, you don't really know anything until you've done it. So let me ask you to go to a deeper level of knowledge. But in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in the voice paraphrase, it gives a great way of seeing a clarity of two parts of the disciple-making process. Jesus is the one that's speaking, and he says, I am speaking with all the authority of God who's commanded me to give you this commission. Go and make disciples in all nations. Wash them through baptism in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then disciple them. Form them in the practices and postures that I've taught you and show them how to follow the commands. I've lay, uh, the commands I've laid down for you. And I'll be with you day after day to the end of the age. Now, Jesus made it clear that there was a process through which he was going to perpetuate his church. And it was a process of people who didn't know him, meeting him, and people who met him, becoming like him, and then helping others go through that same process. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said it this way, A disciple is not better than his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained is to be like his teacher. You see, your salvation, if you're a member of the church, if you're a saved follower of Christ, that was not the ultimate goal of Jesus working in your life. The ultimate goal was that you would be like Jesus. You see, if you shoot for salvation, you'll ask yourself the question, well, can I get by with this and be saved? And you may mess things up. But if you shoot for being like Jesus, you're going to get salvation, but you'll also have a chance of leading others to him. Now, to start off with, I want to make sure just some clarity if, in case you, we don't misunderstand the terms that we're repeating over and over again today. The term disciple, and this is a definition slash description, a disciple is a student who is becoming like his teacher, a student who is committed to becoming like his teacher. 
The same word in Luke chapter 640 where it says a disciple that we read in the International Standard Version. Disciple's not above his teacher. A student is, is the word that's used over and over again. And that same word that's used there will either be translated disciple or student. It's the Greek word for student. But in the Greek language and in the Greek cultures, it carried a different level of commitment than we had. You see, whenever we talk about being a student, I know some of you guys are students. I also know you're not students, okay? I mean, I know you're enrolled in college, but I have saw your report card, and I'm just telling you, you're enrolled, but that doesn't make you a student, okay? And if you're feeling guilty right now, I'm just saying, you know, that could be addressed. In the Greek word, the word student carries with it, if you want a way maybe to make it simpler, a word that we get a same, a same, uh, from the same original kind of word and, and, uh, and background is the word studious. Student, studious. And it has this idea of being, you know, when you're studious, you're going, am I a student? Yeah, am I studious? Maybe not. The Greek language had with it this idea that you're really committed. You're endeavoring. You're trying to become like your teacher. So when you made the decision to follow Christ, you made a decision and say, I am no longer going to live for me. I'm going to live for Christ. I'm, never going to do, I'm no longer going to do what I like. I'm going to do what Jesus likes. I'm going to be more like Jesus than I am like me, the old me. So that's what a disciple is. As we talk today about a discipler, a discipler is the person God or persons God uses to help individual disciples, and that's you and I, to become more like Christ. And here's the thing with that, and you need to note this, effective disciple making requires a faithful teacher and a faithful student. And maybe as we talk through the lesson, because we're going to be breaking the lesson down in really a couple of segments, one is going to be what can a good discipler, what are the, what are the things that a good discipler provides for the people that they are discipling? That'll be the first half. And if you're not careful, you may go, well, I can tune out that. If I'm a baby Christian, I'm not studying the Bible myself with anybody right now. I'm not discipling anybody. I can kind of tune out of that because that's not me. And I'll listen in on that second place, that second part, which is going to discuss what you can do as a disciple to help the person who is discipling you to be more effective in your life. But I want you to know it's important that nobody tune out. If you're a teacher, you don't tune out during the second thing. If you're a discipler, you don't tune out during the second part. If you're being discipled and not yet discipling somebody, you don't tune out the first part because if this is going to happen, you have to be, you have to have both a faithful student and a faithful teacher. And ultimately, faithful students lead to faithful teachers. So no matter where you are in this, it may be that your predominant position now is the one who's being trained and being discipled. But that's not where God wants to leave you because the call to disciple people is a call to every saved believer in the church. And maybe you're somebody who's going, well, you know, I know uh, I'd love to have them help me that they're not going to. But as you listen to what's going on, you may get insight into how you could bring about an attitude in those people that you're working with that can help you help them. So let's just jump in there. We're going to look at a discipling relationship in the scriptures that was one of the most fruitful and it was between a guy named Paul, who at one time was a persecutor. He hated Jesus, hated everything to do with Christ. He became a disciple of Jesus. And he ended up becoming one of the most powerful, influential, fully human beings ever. And much of his influence was realized or aimed through a young man named Timothy. And as you look at these two guys, they provide incredible insight in how a discipling relationship can benefit each of the people and ultimately benefit everybody who might look to Christ. And Timothy and Paul provide the example of what, what is needed if trainees are going to rise to the level of trainer. If student is going to rise to the level of teacher, we get some insight. So we're going to start off talking about the five ways a good, a godly discipler can help his or her disciples. And we're going to get all of these five little principles from a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. And they're, they are implied, and I want to pull them out of the, 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 the implication and talk about them specifically. And what I want you to do is to be asking yourself, especially if you're someone who is discipling somebody, if you're a small group leader, if you're a small group intern, how are you doing at these things? I wanted to have an evaluation on these where you could rate yourself. I did not have the time for the five, so we do it on the last three. But I want to encourage you leaders to be the ones who self-evaluate and decide to open that up and allow you to be transformed. 
But let's read that passage of Scripture, and then we'll come and talk about it. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Paul said, I'm sending to you, and he's writing to the Corinthian church, which is a whacked out, messed up church that needs help desperately. His solution, by the way, is Timothy. I sent Timothy to you. I love him like a son. He's a faithful servant of the Lord. Timothy will tell you what I do to follow Christ and how it agrees with what I always teach about Christ in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, thinking I will not visit you again. So let's just jump right in because of time. we got to fly through these, okay? Number one, I can help the person I'm discipling by providing connection. You see, the body of Christ is designed so which that connection is necessary. If you look at most of the illustrations of Christ's church and it being healthy, if you remove the connection element, you remove the growth. When the Bible says the church is like a body, well, what happens when a part of your body is cut off from the rest of the body? It dies. But it also talks about the church being a family. And we don't have to go very far from our church in every segment here to you know what it's like when you have a family that's not connected. You know what it's like when you have a family where dad is disconnected or mom is disconnected or there's dysfunction and there's massive disconnection. And many of you have survived that and you're fighting with all your might to make sure that you don't repeat that. Well, let me encourage you to know that what we're doing is the same thing. And in fighting as a, some, the people that are discipling you to give you connection in the church, they're also telling you how to have connection within your family. You see, when Paul writes to them, he says, I love Timothy like a son. He doesn't say he's just an ambassador. He doesn't say he's one of my students. He doesn't say he's one of my most prized recruits. All of those are very business-oriented, but they're not very connected with people. And so as he sends this note to him, to a church that is independent and disconnected, he says, man, I'm sending you Timothy, and I love him like a son. And it is so important to know that the church is the family of God. And one of the most important things that you do is not just connecting the person you disciple in your small group with you, but you connect them with the greater family of God, whether it would be Corinth or the rest of this church and with the purposes of God, but it starts with the disciple or the person who's leading, knowing that, man, this is not just a formality. This is just not an organization. This is not a business. This is a family, and there's not a family in the world that does well unless the family members feel connected. Paul did an incredible job when you see him write about Timothy. He is not a blood relative of Timothy. But let me encourage you sometimes just to look in Scripture and see references to where Paul is writing about Timothy. There is an obvious pride about Timothy, and it's almost like there's an honor to be his, to be his father figure, his father in the faith as he describes himself. And that's what a good discipler provides. It's a lot more difficult to walk away from a father and a family than it is a business or a boss, right? So the first thing he provides is he provides connection. Secondly, I can help the person I'm discipling by providing affirmation. He says, I love him like a son. He's a faithful servant. And we're taking a little clip out of this, just a little bit out of a verse and slicing it up. But I want you to know when Paul writes about Timothy, a lot of what he says about Timothy is an affirmation. And when I read through it, it's very easy for me to go, you know, man, this, this, this is significant. Man, it's so encouraging. Paul knows that, that he loves Timothy, and Timothy knows that Paul believes in him. You see, everyone gets discouraged. Everyone needs encouraged. Everybody loses faith in self. Everybody needs someone who will believe for them in the difficult times. And a godly disciple can be the difference in whether a doubt turns into destruction or a doubt develops into incredible life-changing faith. Through the faith and the affirmation that's going on. When I was watching the teenagers on the stage, if you are a parent of a teenager, I'm sorry, uh, no, just kidding. I got like three or four of those kids on the stage were my grandkids. That doesn't lessen the struggle. And I know sometimes I have to watch myself because I can be someone who will let them know that I love them, but I've got to make sure that in the middle of all the struggle, especially in the middle of the struggle, that I'm affirming. I 
I have to do that or I won't be able to help disciple them. If you're not affirming the people, anytime that you get so down on your people that you can't lift them up, it's time for you to move out and get somebody who can really do what God calls them to do. Third thing, I can help the the person I'm discipling by providing demonstration. He says, man, I love him like a son. He's a faithful servant. Timothy will tell you about what I do. You see, one of the cool things about having someone to show you how to do something is that you don't have to figure it out on your own. And whenever you see Paul talking about Timothy in most of the other passages, you'll you'll see that he's going, Timothy, I love you, I care for you. And then he'll say, Timothy, you know a ton about me. We're going to see this later on that's going on. But he not only knows a ton about him factually, he knows how Paul is living. There's a demonstration that creates validity, but it does more than just create validity. It creates an ease of living as a disciple because somebody else has done it before them. You guys have heard me talk about my dad in the past. We used to go hunting, and dad took me out hunting from the time I was a little bitty kid. And we would come to these places where thorns and and, and, uh, stickers were so tall that I would just give up everywhere. They'd be on my hands and stuff, and I couldn't push through them. And dad would say, here, just follow me. And he had shoes that seemed to be like size 36, and he seemed like eight foot tall. And I can remember him lifting his feet and stomping down. And it didn't mean that I didn't have to walk or or try, but it made so much easier to get through because, number one, he had a path that took off some of the biggest obstacles. And he showed me how to walk to get over the smaller ones. There has to be a demonstration. And one of the crystal clear things that Paul says about a good discipler And he passes it on to Timothy. Is it, Timothy, listen, unless you demonstrate what's going on, you're probably not going to see transformation in the lives of the people that you're following. Demonstration is a part of transformation. So you just get to do it, and for the people that's being discipled, they don't have to figure everything out. You just kind of watch. Some of you have been out with some of the people right now we're reading through, I think. And let me just say, I'm really proud of you guys about the way that you're, you're reading the, uh, the material that we're going through with the uh, Authentic Experience book. And let me encourage you to make sure that you, that you use your daily card that's on the back. It's got the questions every day, little things. You can say, what did I discover today? What am I going to change today? And then the day before your discipleship groups, make sure that you go through the discussion questions and get ready. But out of a church, our attendance today will be somewhere around 400, I guess, you know, with the COVID and everything and people streaming, maybe a little over that. But I know we sold 400 books. I know every teenager is going through it. I know every junior high student is going through it. And that's incredible. But the thing is, we, in this book, he talks about how essential it is just to go out and meet people. And have you been out to meet people with somebody that's really good at doing it? You know, I, my, Carrie is, is somebody that's really good at that. And I think maybe some of it he picked up from Reed and I, and I picked some of it up from my dad. But if you go out with Carrie, you know, he's going to have a conversation. And Ashley, honestly, any, anybody they can... And if you've ever went out, sometimes I know I've been with people going, man, how does he do that? Well, all you have to do is watch. And you'll pick up the effectiveness and you'll begin to see some of the how. A good discipler that helps, a godly discipler helps the person they're discipling by giving, providing demonstration. Fourthly, a good discipler provides instruction. Paul says, man, I love him like a son. He's a faithful servant. Timothy will tell you about what I do And what I always teach, a good disciple provides instruction. Never forget that the word of God has power that is incredible. And all the demonstrating that you do apart from the word of God will lack the power that is infused when you are sharing the word. They see what you're doing. They see why you're doing. Look at the word of God and they understand that there is more to it than just your strength or your ability. You see, demonstration is good. Instruction is good. Really, both of them are essential. But when you combine instruction with illustration, you have something incredibly powerful. When, you can, when, when people can grasp, I love YouTube, because not because of the entertainment, because I like fixing things. My dad taught me nothing about fixing things. As a matter of fact, his approach to fixing things taught me a lot about breaking things. Because he never fixed anything. He didn't break it, but my mom constantly nagged at him. And they fought all the time because he never fixed anything. There's a shower light that went out at my dad's house. I've told you guys about this before. 
And I remember at the time thinking, man, that's not a hard change. It was in my dad and my mom's master bedroom, their master bath. And I'm looking up in there when I'm showering one day and going, there's like four screws. That wouldn't be hard to change. My dad ought to do that. Now, I would have stepped in and done that as a responsible son, but I knew that my dad needed to do it to keep his relationship with my mother whole, so I didn't. I was very noble in my laziness, okay? So anyway, I was, I was, I was looking at that going, man, that has been out I know for a year or two. When I got married, right before I got married, the week before I got married, I, was, I thought, man, I'm going to move away. I wonder how long it will be before this light is changed. I don't remember the exact years, but I know it was after my 10th anniversary of being married that I went in, took a shower, and the light was still out. And I thought, man, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change the light bulb that day. It took all of two minutes. So my dad, while he taught me about how to fish and how to hunt and a lot about outdoor stuff, he taught me nothing about being able to fix anything. So I can read sometimes, but every when you read instructions, you go, what are they saying? How in the world, what do you mean, take wire A over wire C? And, and it's not color-coded. How do I know that? And you just get frustrated. Have you ever had someone try to tell you or been through the exercise where you tell someone how to tie their shoe? Tying your shoe is not that complicated. But if you try telling someone who doesn't know how to do it, or even sometimes someone who does, it can be even more complicated, especially if they tie different than you. Because you're undoing all they've assumed and learned that they don't know really, they think they know how to do it right, but you know they really don't know what's right, or they would tie it just like you. And it's confusing. What I love about YouTube is there'll be something that's broken, I'll go out to my car, my fender, and I'll look at it and go, man, I don't understand that. How, how am I going to, I've got all the screws loose. My wife, don't say amen during that time, okay? I've got all the screws loose on this thing, and I, and, and I can't yet, I can't, it won't come off. And so I read, and it says there's a skew, screw on the flange that has to be taken off, and I'm going, okay, I've got that off. Why won't it come off? So I go to YouTube, and there's some Tennessee hick hillbilly you know what I mean? He, if, he, if it had two less teeth, I'd have thought he was my relative. But anyway, he, he's given this lesson on how do you fix this fender on this car. And the first thing he starts off with, he goes, I'm going to start off with this. He goes, here's the bolt. Open up your door. Now, this is to take off the front fender. Open up your door. Now, go all the way to the back of that front door. And see that little bit of plastic there? Pop that fringe up here. Let me show you how. This bolt here has to come off for that fender to come off. And I'm like, he's brilliant. Maybe we are related, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Literally, after thinking about this thing and trying two or three times and just getting frustrated, a minute and a half later, I go out and I have this fender off and everything's taken care of. It was a combination of his instruction and his illustration that led from something that was frustrating and difficult that became easy to do. And that's what illustration, dem il uh, demonstration and instruction can bring together. You see, a godly, spirit-led disciple provides the same combination of YouTube to where you have the instruction and the demonstration com combined in a really cool, life-changing way. And then finally, a good disciple provides correction. So I love Timothy like a son. He's a faithful servant. Timothy will tell you about what I do and about what I always teach. By the way, some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming. He's going away from the one that he has matured into Christ to where he's going to the one he is discipling. And by the way, discipline, disciple go hand in hand in more than just a word association. Paul writes to him and he goes, you're messed, you know, I'm sending Timothy to you. But he goes, well, if Timothy's not there, Timothy's your older brother. But some of you are arrogant and daddy's about ready to get home. You ever have, you know, that message when you were a kid? My mom would be frustrated, you know, and kind of going crazy because I was not always the most responsive of children. And she'd get frustrated and she'd say, I'm just telling you, your dad's going to be home in 15 minutes. And you know what's going to happen then? And I did. So I did everything I could to get her to whip me or ground me or punish me before dad would get home because you don't get double jeopardy in our house. If you've been convicted and punished for a crime, you can't get convicted and punished again. So I'd, say, I'd be rude and say, Mom, you just, you know, I, okay, I'm sorry. And, and I'd try to make it right. But when Dad was home, there was no more playing. And while he is very forceful with the Corinthian church, you can read in Paul's apostles, the apostles' correspondency to Timothy. You can read corrective things. Timothy, 
God didn't give you a power, a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and self-discipline. And that corrective nature, sometimes we, we, we don't like it, but if you're a discipler, if you're a conflict avoider, you're a growth avoider. Because many things, that, that, the reason that prevents people from, from, doing, from growing and becoming like Christ, it's not the absence of doing something right. It's the presence of something that is poisoning their system and preventing them from growth until that's corrected. All the right stuff they do will never pave the way for the growth that they want. And here's, here's the really cool thing. That relationship can be one that is the highlight of your life. Paul and Timothy were not just disciple and discipler. They were father and son. They were lovers of God who got to share in the greatest and the most glorious purpose. And they would get to spend forever together. Good disciplers bring about the transformation of the people they're discipling that leads to a transformation of others because of the growth. Now the question comes in, okay, for those of you who are going, well, I'm not a discipler. Well, listen to those things because you need to know them. But let me give you three ways that the disciple, that you as a disciple, maybe as a baby Christian, maybe somebody that's in a, that you've been around for a long time, but you're still a baby. You know what I mean? You, maturity is not determined by the amount of age that you have. Right? You, we all know people that are 27 years old and they have the maturity of about a 10-year-old. Right? We all know people who have been around church, they are members, they've been around for 15 years, and they're still five in their maturity. Everything has to be done for them. They're not able to do the things that they need to do for others because they're too immature and too self-focused and too unequipped. Well, let me give you three ways, if, that, if you don't want that to be you, three ways that you can help the person who's discipling you. And in the crossings, the basic format, you're going, well, who is discipling me if you've not identified that? In your group, you have both a male and a female leader in your discipleship group, in your cell group. You get together every other work, you'll get to every other week, you'll get together this afternoon, you'll talk about this lesson. You'll take communion together in our small groups. We do that every other week. But during the week, you'll be getting together with the guys from that group. The guys will, and the girls will be getting together with the girls from that group. And so what I'm telling you, that person who's leading that group, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this just out of, of redundancy, I, I think you already know it, but those, that woman in your group, if you're a lady, that is the person that, we, that God has called and we have tasked with discipling you. And if you're a man, the same thing is true for you in that situation. And they can do everything that they should do, but it takes a faithful teacher and a faithful student. We've just kind of given a picture of what a faithful teacher looks like. Now let's look at three things that, marks, that are marks of a faithful student, okay? Again, from the life and the relationship with Paul and Timothy. Three ways the disciple can help his or her disciple. Number one, I can help the person discipling me, discipling me by being available. Just by the availability. There is no real meaningful change without availability. You show me somebody who is avoiding the relationship, and I will show you someone who is dying in their relationship with God, with Christ. Because the church was God's means. That's not, that's not humanistic. It's never humanistic to embrace what Scripture says. And the Scripture says that your connection with the body is absolutely essential for you to grow. Now, does that mean if you're isolated and you somehow that, that you can't survive? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means it's not normal for you to be, at, to be isolated and alone. In Acts chapter 16, Paul meets Timothy. He finds out this guy's mother is a Christian. His mom is a non-Christian. Um, uh, the other way around. His mother is a Christian. His father is a non-Christian. I don't know how they get to know each other a lot. Timothy, was, uh, who, who apparently had become a disciple of Jesus, and, and Paul saw something that he liked about him, but Timothy had a life. Every now and then people go, man, how can I? Don't you know that I have a life? Yeah, I, I know that you have a life, but for those who are disciples, we were supposed to have been living a life for Christ. And so the Bible says in Acts 16, verses 3 and 4, Paul wanted to take Timothy along on the journey. They traveled from town to town. Well, he wanted to, 
I want to take you and you go, well, yeah, that's exciting. But you understand there's an opportunity and in this opportunity is going to require not just a little bit of time, but he is leaving in a very short period of time and he's going to be away from what he knows and what he's familiar with for an extended period of time. But Timothy makes himself available to Paul. If you look at Mark chapter 3, Jesus is calling those that he would disciple, the apostles on this earth. And Mark matter-of-factly records something that isn't always a matter-of-fact in our lives today. Later, he, Christ, went up to the hillside and summoned the men whom he wanted. And they went up to him. You see, it's not always a matter of fact that the person that God places in your life that wants to disciple you, that wants to help you, and wants to be with you, it's not always a matter of fact that you want to be with them. And that may be because you have other priorities. It may be because you have other things that matter more to you. It may be that you don't connect naturally with that person. But the bottom line is that if you're going to be discipled, if you're going to become from just being from saved, from lost to saved, to saved to a more mature disciple, you have to connect. And you need to know sometimes infants don't know who is best to connect with them. Infants are gullible. Infants are uninformed. And quite they like somebody that's only desire is to destroy them. So God gives a church to help you connect. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter how much somebody else tries to call your phone. If you don't pick up, there's never a connection. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 and 11, and this is where Paul is writing to Timothy again. And here's what he says. Timothy, you know all about my teaching my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, and how I responded. How did he know those things? How in the world do you get to know things about, like, how do you know all about his teachings, his way of life, his purpose, his faith, his, his love, his endurance, his persecution? How do you know? Because you've made yourself available to be with him. And for some of us, we're going, why am I not learning anything? And it's because, quite frankly, you don't make yourself available, which means being connected and being open. And if you look at what Paul says about Timothy, what would Timothy have missed in the discipling relationship if it had not been for his connection and his availability with Paul? He would have missed the teachings of Paul. He wouldn't have got to know how do you live as a man of God. He would not have gra grasped his purposes clearly. He would have not have had a strong of faith. He would not have been as patient, as loving, and enduring. He wouldn't have known how to handle persecution, sufferings, and a variety of other things that he got to watch Paul lead him through. You see, there are more ways to make ourselves available now than ever. The internet, cell phones the apparatuses that we have from Twitter to Facebook to you name whatever it is for you college students and whatever you guys, the different things that you guys use, to blogs, to, to there's all kinds of things. You, but you can have all the opportunity and still find a way to not be available, to be distance. And the bottom line is, guys, we can make all the excuses that we want. The bottom line is that I, you and I decide how available. I decide how available I am, and you decide how available you are. And that's true in the middle of COVID. You know, man, this COVID thing has just caused me to disconnect. I would suggest to you that it's not COVID that's caused you to disconnect. It would be COVID that would make it more difficult for you to stay connected. Stress does not cause a weakness. Stress reveals a weakness. And for some of us, the problem during COVID, the problem is not what's a virus attacking us from inside that's new. It's an old problem we've had of not being available and not desiring and not being self-asserting. And we need to decide that we're going to be connected. In Proverbs 13, 20, the Bible says, if you want to grow in wisdom, spend time with the wise. There is no substitute from spending time. And in most translations says, if you want to grow in wisdom, walk with the wise. But since we're talking about availability, I want to use time. But the word walk in that original Hebrew has to do with not just physical walking a step, but it has to do with being beside somebody as you walk. It's literally the emphasis on spending time. 
And you see, sometimes we think, well, if if it were really important, I'd spend time. Can I let you know if you're a baby disciple watching the opportunity to watch somebody who's a more mature disciple? There are opportunities all around that you miss if if you're not available. You want to be a mature Christian? Spend time with mature Christians. God will work in your life. So rate yourself. How are you doing? One is horrible. I'm unavailable. Four, five, six. I'm barely available. Eight, nine, ten. I'm fully available. You can do that this week and kind of talk about that and pray about that. Number two, I can help the person discipling my discipling me by being teachable. I have known people who are incredibly available and absolutely unteachable. They love hanging out. out. They love hanging out as much as they hate listening up. You know what I mean? You're having a good time. You talk about something serious, and they just drift into never land, or they disconnect. I can help the person discipling by being teachable, by really being a student. In 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul said, You, Timothy, have heard me, Paul, teach things that have been confirmed by many witnesses. Now teach this truth to other trustworthy people, who'll be able to pass them on to others. That word trustworthy that's there is, is, is important. But he says, here's the thing. You've got to be able to teach these things. And in the progression of disciple making, through the words of God, it is essential that you have a teacher who is faithful and a student who is teachable. Paul says, here's God's grand scheme of how the world is going to be reached and lives are saved and families that are broken to be put together. It will be teachers teaching students who really want to learn. And because they really want to learn, they're going to teach others also. And for some of us, we want to be teachers. And we're not, we get frustrated. And we blame the opportunities. Well, if I had a better person discipling me, it'd be okay. We blame our aptitude. Well, you know, I'm just not the brightest person in the world. We, ain't, we blame our abilities or our intellect. I'm not the brightest. We, our aptitudes. I'm, I'm not that skilled. And the truth is, most of the time, the problem, if you're not becoming more mature and being able to be more of someone who can teach, it's an attitude problem. Whoever wrote the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew church, wrote to him one time. And he said, you know, by this time, you ought to be teachers again. You ought to be teachers of the word. So here's the Holy Spirit looking into this church and going, dude, you guys ought to be teachers. So it's not an ability problem because they ought to be this. God does not say something that that you ought to be without giving you the ability to be that. What's the problem? It's their attitude. They're not teachable. By this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you all over again the elementary truths of God's word. You need meat. You need milk, not meat, because meat's for the mature. He says, the problem in the past, the reason where you are, you can't teach right now, is that you, you, you can't be a leader because you've not been a student, and you'll never be a leader until you decide you're going to humble yourself and be a student now. Be teachable. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes and says, Then we'll no longer be children tossed and carried about by all kinds of teachings that change like the wind. We'll no longer be influenced by people who lead us astray. He's saying we won't be, we'll be mature, we'll be able to stand firm. When does that happen? Instead, as we lovingly speak the truth, we grow up completely in our relationship to Christ, who is the head. Your growing up to be like Christ involves somebody lovingly speaking the truth, teaching you. So ask yourself this question. How am I doing? Do I allow the person discipling to speak the truth to me in love? And I know if you're like many people, you have sure in love, but they're rude. They, if they would say it nicer, you know, they say to me like, you're ugly. And they got this look on their face and I want them to smile and say, you're ugly. No, that's not what you want, is it? Do you allow people to tell you the truth? Do you allow them, do you allow the person who's disciple to speak you the truth in love? Now, how that shows up in Psalms 145, David said, let a righteous man strike me. It's a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It's oil on my head. My head won't refuse it. He said, man, speak truth to me. 
And by, this, by the way, this is the same one who asked God to reveal everything that was impure, impure in him, in it, not just impure, everything that was not godly in him, and to remove it. That's asking for a whole world of hurt when you ask that. But it's also the attitude that brings a world of help. So do I allow the person speaking to me the truth to me in love? But ask yourself this second question also. Because it doesn't matter how much when somebody speaks the truth in love. Sometimes the problem is not that the person not, that's, loving you, that's speaking isn't loving you. The problem is there is a love problem, but it's not from the discipler to the disciple. It's that you're not loving. Do I allow the person discipling me to speak the truth in love? Hopefully. Here's your question, though. Do I, as a disciple, choose to listen in love? What's that look like? Let me read 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love's not rude. When some tell, someone tells you the truth, do you hear someone going, man, you're obnoxious, you're rude. Love's not rude, love's not conceited. You have people saying, man, you know, I can't even talk to you. You're so arrogant, you don't, it doesn't matter what's going on. You're just, you're just conceited, you're arrogant. And love cannot be made easy, angry easily. Do you fly off the handle when somebody tries to correct you when they're speaking the truth? And honestly, you can go, well, they just didn't they love. I'm suggesting to you, if those are marks of your response in any way, the problem probably is not with that person loving you. It's with your loving them and the truth. And Satan will make sure that you don't. Because Paul tells the Thessalonian church, when you don't love the truth, when Satan knows that when you don't love the truth, you open yourself up to a life of deception and destruction. So how are you doing that? In Galatians 4, 16, Paul asks this question. Have I really become your enemy because I tell you the truth? In verses 14 and 15, he says, what happened to you before you would have given this? You would have done this. This is how you thought of me. I spoke some words of truth that you didn't like. Have I become your enemy because I just tell you the truth? Here's the answer to that. Yes, they had. He had. And some of us today, and I know I've done this in the past, I have vilified the truth speakers in my life thinking that they were trying to destroy me when the truth is they were trying to build me and I just wasn't mature enough to know that. So rate yourself. How are you doing? Unteachable, barely teachable, fairly, fully teachable. Thirdly, not only can I help the person by discipling by being available and teachable, I can help the person that's discipling me by being reliable. Reliable is loosely defined as a person who can be trusted to fulfill the responsibilities or assignments that they are given. Is that you? Because I know it doesn't matter how much a teacher assigns and tries to help if the student doesn't do their homework. I had Algebra 1 twice, which I tell people that I think that should account as Algebra 2. You know, I did basic math, okay, Algebra 1 and Algebra And I barely made it out. Now, there were two problems. Number one, I didn't go to class. That, that hurts. There was 90, 92 days in our semester of freshman one, algebra one, and I was there for just about 50 of them, so I wasn't there a lot. Secondly, I never did any homework. In four years of high school, I never opened a book to do homework at home. And I would have done much better in school if it wasn't for the teachers. That was, honestly, I can remember, you know, you know how we try to blame the teachers and we think we really got something valid, but at, six, you know, 15 and 16, you're really sincere. And my mom would look at me and go, the teacher, the teacher can't do anything if they don't have a student. And this pretty well proves she has it with you. You see, there has to be this, this idea of reliability in 2 Timothy 2, too. Paul says, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people. Now, other translations, I think the 84 NIV that changes a little bit, it's the word one translation is used faithful, but it's not in the sense of full of faith. Faithful used there is fully trustable. You can fully trust this person. And you notice he says, Timothy, the things you've heard me say entrust to reliable people. The growth of the crossing church is dependent upon you guys being reliable. We have planted three churches in 10 years. That's pretty cool, isn't it? This morning, right now, Columbia is going on. And they've got some really cool stuff happening. Right now, at Collinsville and the Inner Belt, they've got some stuff that's cool that's happening. We got new brothers this week from both places and sisters. That's really cool, isn't it? 
But can I let you know, that's not the end of what we want to do. We're looking at property that hopefully we'll be able to get. And I can imagine God using that to bless this area as we're able to build a facility that's larger, a place where we can have a camp out there for our, for our student ministries and especially for our Heights ministry to be able to get away for our, for our people to escape in our cell groups for a weekend and get away and just do a little intensive thing with them. And then we come together in the gymnasium, you know, and play in the sport and everybody's coming together and the attendance soars and as the attendance soars, the Bible study soars, the Bible study soars, baptism soars and baptism and when they soar, hopefully the lost have been saved now. Hopefully the second part of disciple making will happen. The saved will be discipled. But you see, that depends on the reliability of the existing disciples. And all of the dreams of the church can be destroyed if we don't accept our responsibility and be responsible if we choose to be unreliable. In Acts 16.3, the reliability, this willingness to do any assignment that you're asked to do shows up. Remember we said at the beginning, Paul wanted to take Timothy along, so he took him on the journey. In Acts 16.3, it says Paul wanted to take Timothy, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Timothy, I've got an assignment for you. What do you want me to read? Well, I got a little book here on circumcision. Okay. By the way, how'd that go for you? What, Paul, are you asking? Uh, Well, my dad was, was Greek. I've not been circumcised. Which brings up your homework. A young adult man has to be circumcised. And I'm just thinking at his age, I would have said... No thanks. I think God called me to the local church, not to the mission field. (laughs) Right? I'm telling you, it's just the whole thing just rings in my head of stuff of going, this is just weird. But the Jews, for them, it was a massive roadblock. They thought circumcision was essential to have a right relationship with God. They weren't listening to anybody, much much like you and I, who don't have a right relationship with God. Therefore, if he's not circumcised, they're not listening. What do you do? Here's what I need you to do. He is reliable, and without a blink, it seems that he's circumcised. And here's the thing. You know, if Timothy could ask Paul the question, Paul, do I have to do this? Do I have to do this to go to heaven? You know what Paul would have said? Absolutely not. He said that. When it comes to your salvation, Timothy, circumcision doesn't make you more saved or less saved. Okay, so I don't have to do it to go to heaven. Why do I have to do it? Well, you have to do it if you're going to go with me. Well, Paul, that doesn't seem fair. Well, here's why. Let me bottom line. This has nothing to do with you going to heaven. But God's got a bunch of people that he wants to go to heaven beside just you. And if you're not circumcised, they're not going to listen. So this has everything to do with others going to heaven. And like another example in the first century who bled for others, Timothy chose to. Incredible reliability, even in the most difficult of moments. And look at the results of Timothy's and Paul's relationship and Timothy's reliable spirit. In Acts 16, verse 5, the Bible says, consequently, consequences are not always negative. That's what I thought growing up. The consequence is just something that happens because of an action that you take. Because of Timothy's reaction to the circumcision question and being willing to do it, consequently, the churches grew stronger and stronger in the faith And their numbers increased daily. More people were discipled, became stronger in their faith. And because of that second half of that part of disciple making being fulfilled, the first part gets to happen again. Daily conversions. And I'm longing for the day when the crossings has baptisms every day. Every single day. Where somebody says, man, and we don't know what we're going to do other than mature them and send them out for God to do something bigger and better than we ever planned. But what I know is all that big stuff is tied 
to the small stuff. So how are you doing? Are you unreliable? Are you barely reliable? Are you very reliable? In Hebrews 13, 17, the writer says, obey your leaders or obey your rulers and recognize their authority. That word rulers has to do with somebody that God has placed in your, they're a ruler, not because they're a master of a, of a slave. They are rulers because it has been the job that God has given to them. Obey your rulers and recognize their authority. They're like men standing guard over your spiritual good, and they have great responsibility. Try to make their work a pleasure and not a burden. By so doing, you'll help not only them, but yourselves. Can I encourage you if you're a baby Christian, if you're new and if if you're a baby or immature, will you make a decision to make it easy for the people that are discipling you? And if you're someone who is in a role that you are discipling people right now, that's your primary emphasis. Could I encourage you to make sure that you're doing what you can to help that? And if you will, amazing things are going to happen. Inside of your worship bulletin this morning, there's a cardstock piece of paper. And I had one of them up here at some time. Somebody got a communication card there you can hand me to the rescue here. Oh, Josh, you were faithful, but you were slow. All right. (laughs) All right. Let me encourage you all inside of your building, pull out this card right now. I beg you, member or guest, you can fake writing on it but we do have guards looking to see if you're doing it. (laughs) Would you bow and pray with me? Father, right now we've heard your word, but your word being heard is not the end game or the end goal. You said that you can hear through through James. We can hear a word, a good word, a word from God, and yet we can deceive ourselves if we do nothing with it. Father, maybe there are people here this morning going, man, this is all disciple, discipler stuff. Where do I fit in? I've never really made a commitment to Christ. Well, Father, you brought them here this morning to know that you long for them to commit to you so that you can, Father, that you can save them. Save them eternally, but also save them from themselves right now. So I know that if it wasn't for you, I've been married forever, it seems like, in an incredibly cool way over 40 years. I've got an incredible family with kids and grandkids are following you. And Father, there's not very many people in the world that are more messed up than I was. And I was certain that I wasn't messed up. I was certain that your rules were just restrictive and I was going to do it all myself. But the more that I had the freedom to do what I wanted, the more freedom I had to run, to run my life, the more I ruined my life. So maybe there are people here going, well, I just, I, I, I want something to be better, but I don't know where to start. I'm not sure I believe in God. I'm not sure who this Jesus is. And Father, that's an incredible thing and a place all of us have been. And Father, if they'll just check on that card, I'd like a personal Bible study people, the person who invited them or someone in their area will come with their small group leader and say, hey, can we look at why, what it means to believe in Jesus and why you ought to? That you said faith is the victory that overcomes the world, but you said faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard when someone shares it. And Father, I pray you'll give them the, the, the faithfulness this morning, the, the trust, maybe out of desperation like it was with me, that you're going to say, okay, I'm going to try Jesus, even though, Father, I didn't start following you because I trusted you so much, but because I had no trust in me anymore. And it was the best place I'd ever been, Father. For others this morning, maybe they need to just say, I'm going to be baptized. Maybe they went through those studies and they came to that point on baptism where they saw, man, baptism is not just an afterthought of God. It is at the center of the salvation process. But it's not just a dunk in water. It's a death to my self-rule and my self-trust. And it's where I must surrender and come alive in trusting Jesus and living for him. And Father, we wanted saved, but we didn't. We wanted a Savior, but we didn't want a Lord. So we said, I'm not going to be baptized. God, that's the worst position they can take to think that they know more than you. They miss the plans for your life. And Father, they don't even see the curses they bring on the people that will come after them. So I pray that people might just say, hey, I, I want to be baptized this morning. And somebody will sit down and look at that scriptures, the scriptures, and say, here's what it looks like. Here's what it means. For others, maybe there are people here who've just got issues, and they go, man, I, I'm mad at God, or I don't know, how could God... God, how could you let something like that happen to me as a little kid and love me? Father, questions that are there that Satan puts there that we think are our own, and I know that because, Father, I went through that. And yet, Father, in your word, we find that you are not only the person who forgives, you are the one who heals. 
And Father, the bad things that happen in our life often happen because of somebody who didn't listen to you and this horrible cycle continues. Somebody abuses us that didn't listen and now we are hurt and so we're not listening and we open ourselves up for the next cycle to where we begin to hurt someone else. So whether somebody's been through a, 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 an abusive situation sexually or physically, whether they maybe went through a nasty divorce where they were the faithful one and their mate betrayed them and how could God let that happen? Or maybe they were the one that was unfaithful and they feel the guilt. Father, I pray that they know there's places on that car they can ride and we have people who have been there. Maybe there are people who have had the choice to have an abortion thinking along with much of our world that it doesn't matter. And only to realize that every day since that point they've mattered because they wonder and they begin to hurt and the guilt is overwhelming. Father, you are the offer of forgiveness and healing and in bringing forgiveness and healing, we are able as we accept you and mature to offer forgiveness and healing to others, which is the most incredible gift that you could give to us to turn our hurts, Father, into healing and turn our healing into help. So Father, as our worship team sings this next song, help us to look at that card and to check whatever you would want us to. Father, after that song, we'll sing a final song. And as people leave, we ask them for our members to put their card. There are several baskets, little black baskets that are either on tables in the back or on chairs in the aisleways to put their card showing for our members their continued growth and commitment to being a disciple along with their contribution, Father, because it takes money for the ministry to keep going. For our guests, we ask that they not give money, but we do beg them to give you a chance because, Father, we know you have incredible plans for them. Prans to prosper them and not to harm them. That doesn't mean them be rich, but it means they'll have a life that's amazing and fulfilling. But Father, it's all contingent upon their willingness to seek and surrender to you. So move us to think, move us to ride, and move us to drop that card in the basket as we leave, I pray in Jesus' name.